Hello, hello, hello. I am super excited. So I've gotten the video going. I switched out the USB port. I, oh, oops. I, I also had to um, change out the USB port and dump one of the cameras. So I'm not sure if that camera just does not want to uh, work anymore. I'll have to, I guess, you know, part of troubleshooting is replacing different components until you get everything working. So I'm going to have to get a new uh, webcam and see if that does the trick. But in the meantime, so we're down to three cameras instead of four. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know. But uh, we'll work through it. What I've done is I've moved, uh, we're going to use the overhead for the pressing station. And then I moved the other uh, webcam to the to the sewing machine so we'll see if uh, if that works out today I don't know that we're gonna be doing that much sewing today at least not that much uh, machine sewing so uh, I'm gonna pardon me while I do a little moisturization <laughs> oh goodness it is so so hot <laughs> here so the room that I'm I'm sure I've talked about this before but you know the room that I'm in you cannot have fans you know going or anything that generates noise maybe I need one of those like Dyson cyclone things because supposedly those are really quiet um, but uh, and it's actually not the spinning of the blades but more the air uh, movement hitting the microphone and causing some issues so because of that I have to sit in a really hot room um, and, and do this so sometimes you know I, I, I have to get out of here uh, you know sooner rather than later because it gets to be so hot so uh, wonder where you're at are you is you know how's the weather I know in Europe um, especially in Britain there's uh, you know most people I think in the in the UK uh, they were saying, you know, it's it's really hot and not everybody has um, air conditioning. And so when it's really hot like that, what do you do? Uh, so uh, I think some businesses closed early and, you know, you kind of had all of that to deal with. So so this week we had a, a couple of blocks. And I have to say that one of the blocks is so enormous that I actually forgot there was another block. So I probably should have split those out into two different weeks because you will spend, um, you know, your whole life working on one of the blocks. But I think I've got a finished one uh, here. So, uh, so I'll show that uh, here on the overhead uh, here in a second. And uh, sorry, have to adjust the camera <laughs> and turn it on. Um, so this is the... Uh, the block and it's so enormous that I don't think I can get the whole thing uh, in the camera but uh, it's essentially this is an it's an 18 inch block uh, here and what we did was we took some components from from week three we had some components from week five um, and uh, this basket block was from week seven so a lot of these components come together to make this block and then also from from week seven are the stems and the leaves and so this week your task was really to get this block assembled and get the stems on and you would stitch these stems by hand so at least that's the technique that we're going to talk about today how to get these stems and leaves applied that we did so much work last week to or two weeks ago uh, to get put on. So that's uh, what we're going to do. And then the other block is actually a, an enormous flying geese block. And this is the state <laughs> that it's in on uh, my side. So I apologize for uh, for missing that uh, this week. You know, I went to, when I went to post the pattern, I looked at the pattern and I said, oh, oops, <laughs> there was another block. So I didn't get this one piece. So I'll work on that today and get the tutorial uh, posted. By the way, the tutorial for week three, the, the remaining blocks in week three, that got posted. And then I also put some additional instructions for week five for how to cut those trapezoids if the pattern wasn't, um, wasn't sufficient for that. So 
so that is what we're going to talk about today and hopefully that's helpful for you so if you're in the if you're in the uh the youtube channel right now if you want to say hello there's a little chat box up uh would love to see you either chat or leave a comment uh, and you know we'll see that show up here and i can answer questions and also if you're in our facebook group which is uh, facebook.com slash groups slash d a m q a which stands for designers and makers quilting academy so if you would like to join us uh, either here or post your questions uh, in the group if you'd like to join the group would love to have you there as well so let's talk about these bias stems okay so a couple of weeks ago we worked on the bias stems and i have a couple uh here we did this in this lovely green and the stems we were working with the yellow bias um bias bars <laughs> i always want to call them tubes this is the tube the bar is what goes inside the tube you know you can get those there's also a while back a few years ago i found a company that made metal bias bars and i can't find these anymore so that's why you know in the class supplies uh, i recommended the the dritz uh, version but i really like them the metal ones they're just um harder to find and i don't think they're being made anymore um, but we made these bias stems and on the back you can see is the seam allowance so we don't turn these tubes inside out we just press them to get the seam allowance on the back side and if you're finding that your seam allowance is peeking out beyond because you want your stem to be you know perfectly um, flat on the front side you don't want the seam allowances peeking out if they do peek out you know you can take your scissors and just cut the seam allowance back a little bit uh, so that uh, you know it, it doesn't show through on the front or you're not trying to tuck the seam allowance behind your stitches so you've got these stems of various lengths and i know that the stems that uh, we work with they're quite a bit longer than they need to be but i wanted to be sure you know if you want to take your stem honestly and uh you know let me i'll uh, switch over to the right camera but i wanted to say like if you uh where's one okay here's one if you want to take your stem and you know you this is it's your quilt you have this this option but if you want to take your stem for example and do something like um, you know put in you know maybe you want to actually have this go um, around into um, a circle and I'm I'm not uh, you know spending time here to kind of manipulate this down but these are bias stems and you should you should be able to manipulate them but if you want to take this and you know do something fun you know with the stem or you know you don't want it to come right down to here maybe you want it to you know bend up a little bit more and you know maybe you want your stem to go you know that way and have more of a of a pronounced curve to it you know it's really it's up to you and so that extra link just kind of has you know gives you that option um, to do that you know and this stem this center stem you don't have to make uh, come straight down you can curve it if you want to but that extra link just gives you that flexibility to do that so when you're working with these bias stems there's a couple of things that you need to kind of note and that is for this we're using these tiny these are actually called applique pens and the unique thing about the applique pins is that um, they are really tiny. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's a it's a very tiny pen. It's a short pen, and not at all like the you know our if you look at our flower head pins. Whoops, that is not the thing you want to do. <laughs> on but this is live this is what happens so you know we've got this applique pen and this is you know our flower head quilting pen so you can kind of see that there's quite a bit of difference in the length also the heads on these are really small oops <laughs> 
<laughs> that flipped right off the table and over there somewhere. So I hope it landed sharp side down. I'll have to remember to go and find that again. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be really interesting trying to find that again. All right, let me pick up a few of these pens, but, um, these, and I, and these are glass head pens. So they're also uh, heat resistant. Okay. So, uh, so the thing about these, these applique pins is they're small so that when you're pinning your applique units to your blocks, the pins aren't getting in the way. Now you can imagine if I had a bunch of these, you know, really long flower head pins where, you know, the, the, the ends are peeking out and my threads constantly getting caught around the flower head and all of those things. So I know sometimes it seems like I'm, you know, every time we do one of these quilt alongs, I'm talking about a different kind of pin, but that's because I want you to learn the different uses for the pins and, and you know, why there are so many pins. And certainly, you know, I don't use every single pin on the market, but there are certain things that I say, you know, this is, this is fit for purpose. And I like to do things and have the right tools to make my job easier when I'm, when I'm quilting. So I'm going to stop for a second and just see if anyone has come in to announce themselves. I know we have a few people watching. So it looks like Mary's here and has announced herself. Hi, Mary. Good morning. And Miss Janice, good morning. Oh, you're so sweet. Janice says you're great. Thank you. Oh, you're great too, Miss Janice. I love when you quilt along with us. So this is super great. I'm also really excited because of the relative lack of technical difficulties that I had this morning. I did again get started a little bit late, <laughs> but that's because I was swapping out um, the USB units and getting my computer rebooted and the computer wanted to do updates. And I'll tell you a little scary story yesterday. Okay, so I am working on an update to my Get It Done Now Binding by Machine book. If you don't have a copy of this book, don't buy it right now. <laughs> I'm about to come up with a new uh, a new version. It's the second edition. Uh, it's got two, you know, I've reorganized it a little bit. It's got two new chapters and uh, I've retaken uh, photographs and I'm expanding some of the instructions. And even, you know, in some places, uh, as I have worked on this technique over the years, I'm finding, you know, things that, you know, different things that I want to do and different things that I would recommend. So, uh, so with that, I'm, you know, kind of working on that update. So imagine my really, <laughs> not frustration, but uh, real anxiety yesterday when uh, so this is, so yesterday it wanted to, to, to update. So I had kind of too many things open. And so I wanted to kind of reboot so that I could just kind of start fresh and clean and, you know, get, cause when you're editing a book, you've got illustration software open, you got photo editing tools, you've got, you know, the book layout and, you know, there's all sorts of things that you have to have open on your computer. And I will say my computer is on the older side. I can't, remember when I bought it, but, um, but it is, uh, it's quite a few years old and, and I am just, I'm not in the mood yet to go try to figure out what kind of new machine I want to uh, get to do all the stuff that I need to work on. So I went ahead and said, okay, go ahead, update and restart. You don't get an option. You can't just restart without update. If you restart the machine, it's going to perform the update. So I did that and it installed the updates. That was fine. Then after the update was installed, it said restarting and it spun like that for 10, 15, 20 minutes. It was really scary. So I said, well, maybe it just got hung up. So I turned it off, turned it back on and it just spun again for another, you know, I actually had to walk away at that point, you know, so it was spinning. And, uh, and so I was trying to do other stuff, but I kept looking at it and it's just spinning and spinning. And so, you know, it freaked me out because this laptop, you know, it has my entire life. I'm not exactly worried about the files because I back up my files. I do that pretty regularly. So I'm not worried about losing data necessarily, but it's just the fact of having downtime when you don't have your computer because I have stuff to do. <laughs> and so I 
what I actually did was I said, I can't sit here anymore. So I went to the grocery store. I did a little bit of shopping. I came back. So I was out for probably an hour-ish. <laughs> and I come back and it is still spinning. So I, as a last resort, I shut it off again and I left it off and I had lunch and I ate and then I came back and I turned on the computer and it was fine. <laughs> so, um, so we're back in business, but this morning when it wanted to update again, I was crossing my fingers because, um, you know, that's just, it's super scary. It's super scary. So me and technology, you know, <laughs> and it's kind of funny cause I, you know, people say, you know, well, you work in technology. How do you have so many problems with technology? But, you know, I work, I work in technology. I support the technology. The, I support the techies, right? I'm not necessarily a techie myself. I just support the, the techies. So anyway, um, I, with all of that, I was just checking, you know, it's like the little song and dance that you do to see if anybody had questions or comments before I continue. So don't see any of those. So let's just, uh, let's just keep going. All right. So we've got to get the, the overhead back on. Okay. So you can see here that I've got my center stem pinned and what I've done is when you get this pinned, the stem actually has to be inserted into the seam allowance. And uh, give me one second, I'm gonna just adjust the, the zoom level here and see if we can just zoom in a little bit so I can show you that this, the t upper part of the stem has to get tucked into this seam allowance. And the way that we do that is we have to do a little bit of unsewing. And, you know, in week uh, week five, you learn to do a little bit of unsewing as we were working on those trapezoids. So you do a little bit of unsewing here in the seam and you tuck in that stem. So I thought I'd show you how we do that, how we work with the bias stem to create that slight curve and get the and get it inserted into the seam allowance. So I'm just gonna take one of my one of my bias stems here, and obviously I need to zoom out some more so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so we're gonna take one of these bias stems, and we've got to curve this from here, and I'll just move this up a little bit. So we've got to curve it from somewhere in this position and exit the block over here. So with the bias stem, this is something where, you know, it is pliable and you can manipulate it. These thicker stems, you know, maybe they don't, you know, it's a, it's a softer curve. And if you want a more pronounced curve, you just have to play with it um, a bit more, but you can get this thing to, you know, you can get it to curve around um, if you play with it some. But what we're gonna do is, so I've got this kind of angled out a little bit, and what I want to do is just get that tack down and hang on. I don't wanna actually pin into my pressing surface, so let me get that out of the way. I like to pin on a nice flat surface. So I want this to kind of hit the block in this general area. So I'm gonna take one of my applique pins and just get that guy. And I'm going through the block layer and through the bias stem. And so I'm just kind of gently manipulating this to get kind of the shape that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna just curve this out um, a little bit and insert another pin here. So I'm just kind of getting the general shape that I'm looking for. And then I want it to exit the block somewhere in this area. Okay. And that is another pin. Okay, so now that I've done that. And if you want to, you know, you can clip off 
you know, some of this, you know, don't clip off too much because if you adjust, if you want to make any adjustments, you want to make sure there's enough room for you to make that adjustment. But I've kind of got the general shape here. So then I'm going to come back into this area. And I also wanted to show you, um, you know, it's so easy. Series 1700 is running on PBS and I actually have a little project. I have several projects there, but Series 1700 is running and I show you how to make this super cute little pin cushion. And this pin cushion is so perfect for these tiny little applique pins. So that's what I use this one, this little tiny pin cushion for is for my applique pins. But uh, I just, I put them, they're, them in the package there, but when I take them out, they go into the pin cushion. So, okay, so now that I've kind of got this general shape, I can come back in and pin. And the way that I pin is I want some pins facing this direction and some pins facing the other direction. So as I take pins out, it's still secured down. So I leave probably two inches between any pin that's going in the same direction. Okay, so, so I just come in here and add pins in between. Okay, to get that pin down and then I come to the other side and so I'll kind of turn this around and get my pins and put pins in the opposite direction in between so that's how I get my pins uh, secured in here onto the bias stem so you can see that's pretty easy to manipulate the bias stem we've introduced kind of a very gentle curve if like i said if you want a more pronounced curve you'll have to play with it um, a little bit more the wider stems it's a little bit more challenging to introduce the curve because the stem is uh, so much wider you can you tend to do kind of all of that curly manipulation with the smaller uh, with the smaller stems but it's you can still do it it just it takes a little bit of effort but I just wanted this very simple curve uh, in here. And so that's what we need to do to get that, to get that kind of secured, okay? So now we've got to deal with the upper end of this. And you know, this stem, you know, I tried with this stem to kind of perfect, perfectly center it or get it pretty close. This stem, I don't really have coming directly out of the center, it's kind of off it's off at an angle and you know it's up to you that's kind of the look that I'm okay with if you want it perfectly centered that is up to you but what we need to do is then from the other side come in and I will zoom in so we can play better together so you need to come into the back side of this and take out some of the stitches so I can feel I've got my finger my index finger on the back side so I can feel and put my nail right next to the stitch that has to come out and it's not very many stitches that have to come out you know you can take out you know maybe and this is like right in I managed to get this right into the seam here so it's a little challenging to get it from this side but what you can do after you get a couple of stitches taken out is flip it over to the other side and just kind of you know if you wiggle it a little bit you can see that seam you know kind of come apart and then you can insert your seam ripper and take out a few stitches you don't need to take out that many but just manipulate it a little bit just to get that open and then you shove the stem through the hole that you made okay so and I'm just using my seam ripper to just stuff through there so can you see that that stem is now into that seam allowance and then what I need to do is get this nice and flat Okay, so I don't want to, because this hasn't been hand stitched, I wanna make sure that this is in the right place. So when I do stitch this back down, it is perfectly where it needs to be. 
And then once you, once you do that, then you just take this back to your sewing machine and you stitch that closed and clip this excess fabric, okay? So that is what I have done here on this block. I've inserted the stem. I've gone in and stitched this opening closed and trimmed the excess stem, okay? And once you do that, you can, you can go ahead and press that again. And then we just need hand stitches to secure this. So the thread that I'm using for this is a, it's an 80 weight. And you can, if you got a kit from me, I sent you a, a, an 80 weight spool that's kind of a light sage color. And that is perfectly fine to use on this. But I sent you guys all of my 80 weight sage. And so this is what I had left um, for, um, for me to work with. So this is a little bit darker you know, then my stem, but I'm doing tiny hand stitches. And so it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't be that obvious. So, you know, you can't see my hand stitching here with this darker thread, even though I definitely did use the darker thread. So, um, so that light sage that I sent in your kits is perfectly fine. And if you're having trouble with finding 80 weight, um, I do carry 80 weight, I just don't have it listed. So if you are interested in in 80 weight uh, thread, um, just you know send me a message or post something on Facebook and let me know and I can get a hold of a spool um, for you and send one. Okay, and that's if you didn't order the, uh, it was in the, not the quilt kit, it was in the class supplies kit. So in the class supplies kit, you would have gotten a spool of 80 weight, you would have gotten these pins, you got the bias bars, so you would be really all set for this particular, sorry, I'm trying to pick up pins. Um, so you'd be all set for this particular uh, technique. Okay, so I'm going to close up my pins and I'm going to pause for a second and let's just switch over to the face camera <laughs> and I'll just pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions. So I'm actually not seeing any questions here in the, uh, the chat and I'm just checking Facebook to see if there's anything in Facebook that anyone has to say and it doesn't look like there's any comments over on the Facebook group. So quiet crowd kind of today this morning, but that is okay. We just keep moving because you can always come back to this video and other people can find this video and come back to it uh, for more of this instruction. So, all right, so let's head back to the overhead camera and I'm going to zoom out a little bit just because I need to do nope not that way <laughs> I'm going to be doing a little bit of hand sewing but I don't want you to get my entire arm in the photo so you want to take your uh your 80 weight thread and yes I use a thimble you want to take your 80 weight thread and thread a needle and we're using a single you can't see this on the monitor, but it's a single strand of thread. So even though it's doubled in the needle, I've only knotted one side. So I come in and I like my knots to be on the back. So I just come in on the back side of this and just put my needle um, in the back side and try to come out behind the stem. Okay, so I've got my needle in here. There's the thread, the knot is in the back, and I've come out behind the stem. So this is kind of a large block to work with, but as you're stitching your stem, I just kind of puddle the block in my hand. You could also work inside of a, of a hoop. I don't hand piece in a hoop. Sometimes I think I should because, you know, sometimes when I'm puddling, I end up you know stitching the block to itself so just pay attention to where you're you're holding uh, the block but what I do is I take a little pinch from the stem from the back side okay 
So let me zoom in a little bit and we'll see if that uh, helps, okay? So I come into this from the back side and I grab the edge of the, the stem, okay? And then I pull that through. My next stitch then is into the background fabric and I'm kind of underneath the stem. So I don't want to have my stitch, um, I don't want to have my stitch, you know, out here into the background where you can see it. So I try to go underneath a little bit and just take a stitch that is, you know, maybe three sixteenths to a quarter inch um, long. And so I take that stitch into the background and then come up through the stem on the edge. So can you see how I have kind of pinched that background and I'm coming back up through the stem? Okay, pull that tight, but not too tight. You don't want to cinch it, uh, you know, and uh, change the shape, but you also wanna make sure that your thread gets buried in there. So again, I come up underneath, grab the background, come up a little bit away and up into the side of the bias stem. So this is, I don't know if this is, uh, I wouldn't clear, classify this as a, as a blind hem, you know? I don't know if we call this an applique stitch, but this is how I do my bias stems, okay? If you want to do a blanket stitch or a stem stitch or any type of decorative uh, stitch. If you wanted to use a heavier weight thread and do this more as a visible applique, that is perfectly fine. It is your quilt and you get to decide what you want to do with it. I will say that if you, you know, maybe you're not super excited about the whole bias stem thing, um, that this block is really huge and if you don't put something in the center, it's going to look a little bit plain. So it is something that I would recommend that you that you actually do that you that you do utilize the bias stems and do this method. But it's completely up to you how you want to finish this. If you want to do applique by machine, you certainly can. But I love just coming up with different things to teach you techniques so that you are learning new things. And I was actually quite surprised that I really like <laughs> making bias tubes and stitching them by hand to fabric. And it's not something, you know, applique isn't something that I do um, a lot of usually the applique that I do is for your benefit so then you at least get exposed to different techniques and you know I can kind of help you on that front but in general I don't do a lot of applique and so I was quite surprised that I actually enjoy doing these bias stems and stitching them by hand so uh, so, you know, color me surprised, <laughs> you know, this is not something, this is not my normal technique. I am a piecer uh, by nature, not an applicator, certainly not a hand piecer or someone who does a lot of handwork. And frankly, you know, I think maybe some of that has to do with time because I don't often get a lot of time to just sit down and, you know, work on you know, work on my own projects, let alone work on a project that is a little bit more, you know, time consuming or, or that needs more attention. So I am just, you know, I surprised myself by liking and enjoying this technique. So as I go along, I am, you can see I'm removing the pins that are on this side of the stitching path, but because I put pins on the other side facing the opposite direction, the stem is still pinned down to where, you know, I don't have to worry about it shifting, you know, out of the way. So you just continue with that stem, you know, or, or that uh, uh, stitching, this applique stitch, okay? And when you come to a point that's a little bit bulky, I don't worry too much 
about the bulk, I just try to go through the upper layer. So if I come to a seam, I'm just going through the upper layer of that, uh, of that background and coming out through the stem. So you don't have to try to get down through all those layers. You can just get the upper layer of the background. But you know, if I do end up getting the seam allowance, I don't worry about it, you know, too much. It's just, it is what it is. The needle goes where it will. The one thing I wanna make sure is that I'm not stitching the block to itself on the back. And then, so if I turn this over, you can see my stitches here where it's kind of, it looks like a running stitch on the back, but on the front, it's kind of hidden on the side. And you know, you can really, I have this zoomed in and I'm showing you the side and this darker thread, you know, does show up a little bit. But you know, when you look at this from the top, you really cannot see those, uh, those stitches. But like I said, if you ordered a class supply kit, you got a, a sage, kind of a, a light sage color, and that works. Um, if you want to get a thread that is more closely matched, you can certainly do that as well. All right, so let's see. Uh, so Mary says, I was getting a little skeptical or scared about the flowers and stems, but am now falling in love with this quilt. And I have to say, Mary, you know, this is, you know, I was, I was skeptical too, just as I was designing it, uh, you know, and, you know, we had a little bit cause, you know, typically I don't have Linda, you know, kind of t teaching too many techniques in the, you know, in the patterns, we tend to stick to a lot of piecing. Um, you know, sometimes we'll do, you know, she'll do the curve piecing and all of those things. But, you know, this quilt has a lot of new techniques. And, you know, as I was designing this quilt, I was also kind of worried about the whole, you know, the whole stems and leaves. But this quilt is stunning. And I have a lot of favorites. Like I think every, you know, every new quilt that I design becomes a new favorite. But this one, I really think you're going to enjoy this. And yeah, there's a lot of handwork involved in this one because we introduced EPP and I had you is, and I think too that this is a, I know that I'm using the fabric here for this. And so in my video, you're using Charlotte uh, from Riley Blake. And so it's just, it's absolutely um, gorgeous and so I hope that you know you all see that this effort is worth it and you know this particular piece it's great to do this before you get the blocks assembled because you know if you wait until you start piecing the quilt just gets kind of large and unruly and uh, so it's better to do this kind of detailed work while the block is, you know, and I say, you know, you don't want it to get large and unruly, but hey, this block is, it's an 18 inch block. It's already unruly enough. And remember that we are making a king size version. So I think that if anything is going to slow people down with this one, you know, even the blocks will continue to be released. But I think, you know, it's probably going to be a little bit before somebody posts a, a finish just because of the handwork that's involved. You know, I'm still working on my EPP uh, hexagons, right? Uh, so I'm still working on those. I know other people are still working on those. I try to take, you know, I try to take the EPP on the train with me. And what I discovered is that the train is, it's a fairly smooth ride, but the train bounces just enough that it's really hard for me to, see where the needle's going in and I have progressive lenses and so you know all of that bouncing with the handwork just does not work for me so I actually have to I tried it once I don't think I can do handwork on the train ever again I don't know if I can do it in the car but I'm usually the one driving so there's not too many places for me to kind of stop and and take a break but what I've tried to do is uh is make make a flower a day and i say that and you think by now i should be done you know but the idea is that if i sit down to start a flower i want to get that flower finished because um you know that way i can at least you know say that i've, I've got to a certain progress point right so 
the and you're probably wondering why my camera keeps shutting off the overhead camera is just in in view mode if i had it in record mode it would um it would shut off but i don't want to just fill up my hard drive <laughs> on the uh on the overhead with uh just you know hours of me just kind of sitting here sewing stuff so um so that's why i don't have the overhead camera on and it kind of keeps shutting off like that but i'm just working my way down the stem and you can see just in the last you know five minutes i'm about halfway down the stem so it doesn't take it doesn't take that long to get this stem stitched down so i'm going to pause for a second and just see if there's any other uh, comments here we'll check the facebook group and see if anyone's posted there okay don't see anything there so we just keep sewing so i've got a lot of stuff going on here at the studio so i finally have time to sit down and do a a a reveal of my quilty box so did anybody get my June quilty box I know it's July and you're like why are you just not opening your box but um, I have a lot of stuff going on in June um, but hopefully you got a chance to order your quilty box if you did not I will post the link to where you can purchase the uh, the June quilty box uh, from uh, from there so you can just get the individual box I'll post that link up. It's a super fun box. So I'm going to do that box, uh, that unboxing over on my Lovebug Studios um, business page. So if you don't follow that, uh, it's Ebony Love Lovebug Studios. It's a business page here on Facebook, or not here on Facebook because we're actually on YouTube, but it's a business page on Facebook. So that's where I'm going to do the unboxing of my quilty box so that you can see the awesome stuff that's inside. Also, um, kicking off my fall teaching season, we've got Madison Quilt Expo coming up. And what's really amazing and fun is that, you know, I hardly get to tell you guys about some of the classes because they sell out so fast. I think um, I'm teaching a uh, machine binding class at Expo. And that filled up right away, and the 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 uh, waiting list filled up right away. So some people weren't able to get into that class. Um, I am also teaching a die cutting for beginners uh, class there. So if you did not get a chance to sign up, and you'll be at Madison Quilt Expo, I think there's still slots open in that class. So um, and then I have a couple of lectures. So one of my lectures is. Uh, building a mystery and let me just let me actually look at let me look at my schedule for Madison where did I put my phone um, so if I could find my telephone I could actually talk to you there it is okay so my schedule for Madison and I'm teaching on Friday or on Thursday and Saturday so on Thursday, uh, I have an early lecture. It's called Building a Mystery. And so this is all about the mystery quilts that, uh, you know, that I've got. So that's super great. And I just talk about, you know, how we, how we actually do these mystery quilts to take some of the fear out of it. And then in the afternoon is die cutting for beginners. Okay, so that's Thursday. And then Saturday is a very popular lecture, Quilts from the Backside. People love that lecture. Um, they love to see the, the backings that I create from, from, the, from scraps. And then Binding by Machine is in the afternoon on Saturday. So like I said, Binding by Machine is full on Saturday. I think Thursday, there's still some slots left in that so i think maybe if i'm going to talk to you i should look at you <laughs> so uh so that's what's going on in madison so that's september 5th and september 7th that i'm teaching and then if you're going to be at fall paducah this is actually the last fall paducah i'm teaching uh several uh mostly long arm quilting but i also have some some piece in classes going on. So, uh, so classes for me start on Wednesday. In the morning is a class, uh, and this is uh, September 11th. 
So uh, in the morning, or sorry, in the, in the uh, afternoon, I'm teaching crowdsource your quilting design. So that's super great because you can bring a quilt, bring a quilt top with you. And in class, we're going to do some sketching, some designing, and then your fellow students can kind of help you with ideas. So bring a quilt top that you want to get quilted. Then in the afternoon or in the early evening is, um, is a long arm quilting class. So it is straight line quilting with rulers. So that is a fun class that you want to, uh, you know, that you may want to be part of. Uh, you don't have to have a long arm to take a long arm quilting class. It's just something fun uh, to do. So that's on the 11th. On the 12th in the evening is free motion fillers. So we're just going to go through a bunch of free motion filler designs. Those are super fun. You'll get to play on the long arm machines and learn some techniques uh, there as well. And then on Friday, the 13th. Oh, isn't this a fun week? <laughs> you know? Um, so, uh, so we've got, um, in the, I'm doing my quilt from the backside lecture again. And, uh, so that's super fun. So that's again in Paducah. And then in the evening is, uh, micro quilting. So another long arm quilting class. And then on Saturday, is a um, the Wayfinder block party. So some of you were, you know, sent me blocks to work on uh, this Wayfinder quilt pattern. And so, so I'm finishing up that, that class sample and teaching that class at uh, Fall Paducah. So that's on Saturday. It's super fun. So, you know, come and enjoy that. So that is in September. And then uh, Houston, so I'm going to skip to end of October. Houston is, um, the, the registration is open and classes are, I swear, like it took like a day for all of my binding classes to fill. So, um, binding by machine, I'm teaching on Monday, the 28th and again on the 29th. And then uh, I have a, a class called Binding Crazy Angles. So that's a new one that's coming up here. And uh, uh, so what happens in Binding by Machine is we work on just 90 degree angles. And so many people have said, you know, what do I do about hexagons or, you know, inside angles or scallops or something like that. And so that's what we work on in the Binding Crazy Angles class okay uh so that is on that one's also sold out so sorry about that uh, but in the afternoon on the 30th um is uh four ways to curve perfection so we talk about curved piecing and i know if you do my quilt alongs you learn a lot about curved piecing so that might not interest you as much but then on on Thursday the 31st I've got secret die cut block sampler and that is that's been such a popular class uh, you know you come in you don't know what you're making but we're using die cuts to cut the fabric so that is uh, that's a super fun uh, class to attend and participate in and then I have a business planning class in the afternoon so that's on Halloween then on Friday is Friday Sampler and a lecture called Converting Quilt Patterns for Die Cutting. So, you know, I talk to a lot of people about my Eden system, the equivalent die notation system. So this is the first time that I'm doing a lecture about actually using that system to convert quilt patterns. So that should be, uh, that should be super fun. Hope if you're in Houston, you take that. And then in the afternoon, we st in the uh, evening, I should say, is a long arm class. So that's my free motion fillers class on Friday uh, in the evening. And then on Saturday, I've got all day long arm classes and it's uh, straight line quilting with rulers and micro quilting designs. So if you are interested in long arm quilting classes, I'm teaching at both AQS Paducah and Houston. So if you go to either one of those shows, you will be able to um, participate in that. And then on Sunday morning, 
uh, just to kind of close out the show is the Wayfinder Black Party. So if you attend AQS um, or Paducah, sorry, <laughs> AQS or Houston, the quilt festival, um, there are some overlap classes there, but I'm teaching way more classes in Houston. I have 12 classes in Houston, so it's a pretty full schedule. But if you are interested in taking any classes from me, those are kind of the, the, the options this fall. So Madison, AQS, Paducah, and Houston. All right. So great. So I'm just checking to see if there's any other comments or questions here before we keep going. All right, so let's pop back over to the overhead camera. So I just want to get to the bottom um, and show you how to kind of turn uh, turn at the bottom so um, so we don't have that much further stitch I'm gonna have to rethread my needle here in a second but we're just working our way down the stem and so I really hope that you can see this and it's helping you to kind of take some of the anxiety out of stitching these bias stems. It's really like once you get the stem placed, you pin it uh, in place. And also I do wanna say, if you don't have these tiny applique pins uh, and uh, that's not something that you took advantage of and all you have are the large flower head pins, um, I'm not saying don't use them. Um, you know, another option, if you just need a shorter pin, you know, we had these pins that we were working with, um, I think during, and a green gables I think um, so you might have some other pins that are shorter that you know may also be an option but you know if all you have are the flower head pins you know I don't want that to be the deterrent the reason that you don't use this technique or you don't try it but I will say that you will be so much happier and less frustrated with stitching these stems if you have pins that aren't constantly in your way. So if you don't have them, dare I say, make a trip to local craft store. And I'm just, uh, I've got to switch my thread, so I'm gonna just tie this off at the back. So I've taken my needle, brought my needle to the back, and I take my needle through the loop twice and then uh, pull that off. Okay, so I need to re-thread my needle. So this is going to be, you know, not look like much here, but I'm just here, I'm spooling off about um, 18 inches of thread, cutting it off, and I'm just re-threading my needle. The other thing too is, you know, get a needle that is comfortable for you. The needles that we're using for um, EPP, you might find those a little bit long for doing this work. So um, I think I have a number, um, a number nine um, or a number ten uh, John James uh, quilting, uh, quilting between. I think is what. No, this no, this is a little long for a between. So I'm not sure what this needle is, <laughs> but it's shorter than the pins that we're using for EPP, but it's longer than a between. So sometimes with hand needles, with hand needles, it's you know something that you have to find a comfort level because you want it to be, you know, short enough that you can manipulate it, but not you know too short that it actually hurts your fingers to pull through. Also, if you're not used to stitching with a thimble, that might be something that you wanna get used to. And my thimble is pretty fancy. So this is one of those thimbles by TJ Lane. I actually had a chance to meet TJ Lane and she's super petite and just, um, just a really great um, artist. But I saw her um, at a show and I just had to thank her for um, the thimble. The one thing about this thimble is um, this is my winter thimble. <laughs> so um, so my fingers are a little bit um, more 
um, shall we say, uh, swelled <laughs> now. So it's, uh, you know, and my fingers are a little bit sweaty. So this thimble doesn't fit um, as well. But there's all sorts of thimbles. I like, I prefer this open design so that um, when I decide to grow my nails out, I can still do handwork because the nail can just kind of come over the spot. So I love having the open the open thimble it's also cooler <laughs> you know for my fingers so that it doesn't sweat as much i mean it's still a little sweaty i have to say um but um you know having a thimble but they do have like you know you can get uh, uh leather thimbles you can get um you know just those those pads those sticky pads that that stick on the end of your fingers I think with thimbles, I don't like necessarily buying packaged thimbles because the thing about a thimble is it needs to fit well for you to enjoy using it. You really want a thimble to just really be kind of an extension of your finger or, um, you know, it's just covering, it's just covering the tip of your finger so it should feel really integrated and natural to use. And when I'm using the thimble, I use the the ridge on the thimble to push the needle so that I don't build up uh, you know I don't I prefer not to have a callus built up there and I also don't I'm such a, a wuss about pain that uh, I don't want to um, you know have to stop stitching because my finger hurts um, so to me the thimble helps me to stitch longer so Anytime I need help pushing the needle, that's what I'm using the thimble to do. Okay, so we just continue stitching, stitching away, and we're coming up toward the bottom here. And I'm not gonna have you sit here all day watching me stitch stems all day, as fascinating as that might be, but I do want to get to the bottom and talk about, you know, where do we, where do we stop stitching? because the one thing that we don't want to do is you know stitch in a way that where something's going to get cut off so and it's not so much with these side units you know we had that issue actually with the center um stem and i guess i can just show you the center stem <laughs> because um so when we assembled this block i'll just zoom out a little bit sorry for the camera shaking other way other way thank you all right so when we had this center stem when this block got assembled there was actually you know this part of the rectangle stuck out and I did that because I didn't want to um, I thought it was going to be easier to teach you to just trim the unit than to have this funky rectangle with the corner cut off from the beginning so this stem you know kind of extended beyond here if you can imagine, <laughs> you know, it extended beyond here along with a flap of fabric there. And so what I wanted to make sure is that when you stop stitching and you cut off that flap and this extra bit that you don't accidentally snip this, the hard <laughs> working stitches um, that you made. So on this one, I drew a line, um, you know, to, where this was going to get cut off or at least in you know within the seam allowance here and so when I approach the bottom and I come up to you know this line what I did on the back is I stopped stitching just shy of that line and then carried my stitch over and started working my way back up to the top and it's the same thing here you know when I get to the bottom here I don't want to stitch kind of all the way out to the end because I'm trimming this off. So I don't want to put this in a way that's going to be detrimental to the security of my stitches. So I'm going to stop just shy of this. So you're stopping, a, you know, less than a quarter of an inch away from the edge so that your stitches are in that seam allowance and they're not getting cut off. So that's what I'm aiming for is to stop shy of the quarter inch mark on the back of the unit. So, you know, so that's what I'm aiming for as I am stitching this down, okay? 
So, and again, I do that because I don't want all of this hard work stitching this stem down to be in vain and have it get cut off because I had to trim a unit. And then I don't worry too much about the ends because once we get the basket stitched on, then all of that is gonna get encased in the seam allowance. I just don't want my stitches, my actual stitches to get cut. Okay, so I'm approaching the bottom here um, pretty quickly. I am gonna just pause for one second just to check on comments and just make sure, okay, I don't see any other comments. I just, I like to do that because sometimes, you know, people will have questions and I wanna make sure that I get to the questions before I've gone too far off into some other topic. So in this stitching, it's so relaxing. And this is kind of, you know, this is, maybe I should do these Facebook, or not Facebook, these uh, live streams more often because it actually gets me to sit down and do sewing. And it's funny because we don't often get to do a whole lot of sewing in these, but there's just something about the hand stitching that is just so, so relaxing. And if the only thing you're doing is watching me stitch, I could see this being a little bit, uh, uh, you know, maybe a little bit boring. I know I've got a, a good little bit of chatter uh, going on here, but maybe this is a little bit not interesting but if you are hand stitching too then it's like we're stitching together and that can be uh very fun so i've got a i've got a little knot don't you love it when you get a little bit of a knot um here so usually what i do when i get one of these um thread knots is i try to get my needle you see i've got a little loop here so i try to get my needle inserted into the knot just to loosen it okay and i may or may not be able to loosen this it's a little hard to do this on camera <laughs> i have to say but my goal is to get my needle inserted into the knot so i can loosen it And it's hard to talk and do this at the same time. Boy, is that a tiny, you know, this 80 weight thread, it's so much easier to do this with 50 weight. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so and just get, if you are able to get, if you ever get a knot like that, if you're able to get the tip of your needle inserted into the knot, you can, uh, you can loosen it without breaking your thread. Or you can end up breaking the thread and then that kind of sucks, but all right, we are coming very close to the end here. I just need a couple more stitches to get to the end. And I'm trying to not, uh, you know, hurry through this because I'm so close and I just want to get to the end so I can show you the turn. Okay, so I'm coming up here to the point where I've probably got maybe three more stitches before I do the turn. Okay, so that was one. Here's two. Okay, I lied, it's four. Okay, there's three and then four. Okay, so I'm up here close to the end. Okay, close to the end, but not at the end. I'm within the seam allowance. So my last stitch, uh, I come up and then I go underneath to the back. Okay, so I'm taking my needle to the back. And you can see here that I am just shy of the end. And then, um, you know, one thing you can do is if you just take a um, you know, you can take a knot here just to secure that stitch. And I'm not breaking thread here. I'm just going to walk across to the other side and get the needle inserted onto the other side. So I just kind of bridged across 
and what you end up with is a long stitch on the back across the stem and then you can continue up the other side so I've got to puddle my block in a different way to work that stitch up the other side okay so that's how I get from one side to the next and where I stop stitching to continue the bias stem work okay so that is stitching the stems when you get to the leaves okay so part of the challenge in the leaves is figuring out where you want to put them <laughs> so we worked on a couple of leaves uh, was that last week where we did leaves and I know I have one around here somewhere that I worked on oops there, there it is all right I just lost the thimble okay so with the leaves so this is basted right so we've got the the leaf basted and now we have to undo that hard work okay um, the other thing is figuring out where we want the leaf to be positioned and um, so I think I did um, six and a half inches here so if I can find six and a half inches so that's about where the leaf gets positioned so it's six and a half from the uh, from the, the top of the stem six and a half inches down I think that's what I put in the photo tutorial so I'm just gonna mark that spot with a pin so that's about here okay and then I need to take the basting stitches out of my diamond and what you should have done is um, and uh, I'm just going to see if I have a different leaf that I did actually starch. I don't think this one got starched. But what you want to do is just make sure that you have taken the time to get it pressed and, you know, really, you know, really pressed down um, and and uh, this edge is nice and crisp so you can do that with a little bit of um, a little bit of spray starch and heat and just get that stitch down um, because when these basting stitches get pulled out what's going to happen is there won't be anything else holding this down <laughs> so i want the leaf to kind of retain its shape so i'm just pulling out the basting stitches here and this is something that for, you know, for EPP in general, you leave the basting stitches in until all the edges are secure. And what's different about this is that, you know, this is really the shape. So it's kind of a, a modified needle turn. So, you know, if we were just to do a needle turn, we wouldn't use the paper uh, as a container for the shape. We actually would have traced the shape around and you know this has I put a little bit of glue on the back side so I'm just loosening it from the glue okay and so once you get that pulled out so there's my paper and you can see it's still kind of retaining its shape and what I want to do is get this positioned kind of where I want it you know in the spot where I want it and again use my applique pins to get this guy pinned into position so I have a hard time with these little tiny pins <laughs> so if you have a hard time with the little tiny pins you are certainly welcome to not use the teeny tiny pins um, you know for this but uh, you know what I want to do is just get this guy positioned where I want him to be and then get enough pins in him so that I know where he is at and I've got the edges you know the edges are still turned under 
and starch will help you to do that. And again, just making sure this is a flat surface so it stays where it needs to be. And you know, maybe I'll put one more pin going in this direction so that this corner stays in place. Okay, so then to stitch this down again, it's just, it's that same stitch that we're using to get the stems down. And if you come to a point where, you know, let's say you're stitching this and, uh, sorry, it's like so high up. Okay, so let's say you're stitching this and you get to the point where, you know, maybe your, your fabric from underneath is peeking out from beyond. You can just use your needle to, to manipulate that. So I'm still stitching the stem. So, um, you know, so if I'm, you know, kind of working with this, I can use my needle to kind of manipulate the fabric a little bit. So, you know, let's say I don't really like the point that resulted. I can use my needle to come in here and just do a little bit of manipulation. So I can get that corner, you know, kind of uh, swept down and you can use your needle to kind of push the excess seam allowance underneath and just really get that stitch down. So it's the same technique as it is with the stems. You're just doing that same stitch all the way around. Really the difference is just getting that, that paper um, pulled out properly. So, and like I said, if you, if you starch this diamond before you pull the paper out, you'll have an easier time preserving that edge. But you know what? This is, don't think that this has to be perfect. You know, this is handwork that we're doing. And, you know, handwork has some, you know, some variation. And, you know, when you look at this guy, this guy is certainly not perfect. You know, I don't have a perfect little pointy point, um, you know, there, but it's on there and um, I think it looks really cool. And I think just the block in general is a really cool block. And, uh, and so it's coming together quite nicely. And uh, just a hint, this block's gonna get even bigger. So, so we have some work to do to get this block, uh, you know, finished up, but, um, but lots of, uh, lots of handwork there, but you can see it doesn't take that long. I do a lot of talking, so maybe it looks like it takes a little bit longer, but if you don't have to conduct a webinar, it might go a little bit faster, um, for you. So let's see. Okay, here we go. Back to the face. All right, so I'm just gonna check comments one more time. Don't see any comments there. And if I check the Facebook group, I'm not seeing comments over on Facebook. So we didn't get to the flying geese block, but the instructions are in the pattern. Like I said, I'll work on getting that block stitched and some photos uh, posted so you can see that in the tutorial. But I had a ton of fun showing you guys the, the, the stem uh, the bias stem um, piecing or, or stitching. It's really fun. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it, but I actually do enjoy it and I can't wait to uh, get those finished. So I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful quilty day today. Um, if it's too hot, you know, stay inside under the air conditioner, turn on something that you can uh, binge and, uh, you know, do a little bit of stitching. So have fun out there. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye.